Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Senior Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project. This is Wednesday, March 16th, 2022, and welcome to the 86th session of MAVEN Project's COVID-19 update, led by Dr. Debbie Gold, a retired infectious disease doctor and hospital epidemiologist from Kaiser San Francisco. Dr. Gold is joined by MAVEN's physician volunteer panelists, Dr. Hunter Hansfield, infectious disease, Dr. Lois Friedman Psychiatry, Dr. Judian Smith Psychiatry, and Dr. Libby Sauter, Obstetrics and Gynecology. After Dr. Gold completes her part of the presentation today, then we will um, pivot briefly to focus on COVID and the effects on mental health, led by Maven Psychiatry volunteers, Drs. Judian Smith and Lois Friedman. Um, they're going to present some findings of one study, um, followed by the opportunity during our general Q&A for people to um, pose questions about the treatment of mental health during COVID. So you can um, start thinking about some of the questions that you might have in regards to mental health. The MAVEN Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. We have partnerships with 228 clinic sites. These are federally qualified health centers and free and charitable clinics in 19 states, and we are growing. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, mentoring, and medical education. Thank you to all of our generous donors over the past two years who've made all of our work, including this session possible. Um, we appreciate you all being here. As always, please feel free to share these COVID session recordings with colleagues and friends, um, and they are um, accessible via the Maven Project website at mavenproject.org. Um, our next and final session will be on Wednesday, March 23rd next week. So please mark your calendars. It will be sponsored by Maven Project Clinic Partner Direct Relief, which is a humanitarian organization that um, oversees hundreds of um, free and charitable clinics across the US in addition to the other work that they do. Um, that session will be a little bit different than these, a um, um, little bit more of a, of a summary and rehash of um, COVID. Um, it is hard to believe that we've spent the past two years being educated by Dr. Gold and our physician volunteer panel. Thanks go to all of you, our attendees, for your dedication and commitment to being educated week after week. We are so grateful to Dr. Gold for um, all the work that she has done preparing um, for these talks every week, every month. And a big um, thanks to our physician volunteer panel who have also come to help to support and to answer um, questions during our, um, our Q&A sessions at the end. So we're very thankful. If you have any um, words of thanks to Dr. Gold, to our physician volunteer panelists, um, please feel free to write to me at, um, so I'm Jill Einstein at jeinstein at mavenproject.org. And then I can put together um, some of your words of gratitude for them, for all that they've given us over the past two years. And with that, Dr. Gold, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. And um, as always, uh, what I say today is relevant to today because even though we're two years into it, things are continuing to change. So before I start on the current pandemic, I wanna just say a word about the um, a likely pandemic uh, candidate for the next round. Um, this is um, highly pathogenic H5N1 avian influenza, um, which is spreading, um, I would say, pretty rapidly through commercial and backyard uh, chicken flocks and turkey flocks in the United States. It's already hit um, Delaware, Maryland, and Missouri, and millions of birds have been culled there. Um, there have been 50 new detections of H5N1 in wild birds, which are hunter harvested. I believe that means like, uh, anyway, that's a nice way of saying that they were killed by hunters. Um, and um, these are the first in waterfowl um, and have been identified in Indiana, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. And the uh, significance of waterfowl is that they can fly um, and do migrate during the winter and so can spread um, this highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza to other um, to other areas and can um, spread widely. And also there have been detections in Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee. And I have to add to that South 
Dakota, Illinois, and Wisconsin, which I just read about uh, today. Um, the risk to humans right now is thought to be low, except for individuals who have very close contact with sick birds. However, um, when you have a lot of uh, viral replication in the bird population, uh, mutations happen and can um, this, the, the risk is and worry is that this um, H5N1 will gather mutations that will make it more transmissible to humans. Um, so I have a long agenda and hopefully I will get through it and leave um, a good amount of time for Lois and Judy in to talk about um, mental health challenges. But uh, the, here are the New York Times data for new cases by day. Um, and you can see here the seven day rolling average is about 34,000 new cases a day with the proviso that um, home tests are not um, included in this and people who don't uh, test themselves because of mild infection that they don't recognize as COVID um, also don't test. Um, the cases are now as low as they were last summer uh, when I um, all uh, uh, decided that we were finished with this and that I didn't need to do any talks anymore. And then we got Delta and Omicron. So. Um, hospitalization, seven day rolling average is about 29,000 people hospitalized with COVID every day, and about 18% of those are hospitalized in the ICU. The COVID hospitalizations have dropped about 75% compared to the peak in January, but still um, are at a fairly high level. And the seven day rolling average for deaths is all about 1,300 people dying every day from COVID. Um, this is well below the peak that we had in, um, in January for Omicron, um, but it's still very high. And um, we've ha we have had over 960,000 deaths from Omicron in the United States. We're gonna be closing in on a million deaths fairly soon. Um, I wanted to um, alert you to this article in the Atlantic by Ed Yong. Um, about how did this many deaths become normal for us. And the first few sentences of his paper are illustrative of what he means. And that is um, on March 4th, the US reported more COVID deaths than deaths from Hurricane Katrina. That was just in a single day and not during the peak. Um, on any two days during the week of February 28th, there were more COVID deaths than on 9-11. During February, there were more COVID deaths than from an entire flu season that would be a severe flu season. Um, and during the two years of the pandemic, there have been more COVID deaths than deaths from HIV over the last 40 years. So, you know, we have these numbers and we really become kind of numb to um, what their absolute value is. And the article is about how, how that came to be. He also discussed his article on the PBS NewsHour a couple of nights ago. These are some wastewater surveillance data that now appear on the CDC um, COVID tracker. And um, these are wastewater areas in the United States that monitor for mRNA or for RNA of um, SARS-CoV-2. And um, values are compared to each other every 15 days. And the, um, the gray dots in the middle of the country, are, there's no data. The blue dots indicate that levels are falling, but the red and orange dots indicate that levels of RNA in sewage are actually increasing. And you can see a lot of that happening in the Midwest, um, in the Northeast, and even in, uh, there's one uh, red dot in California indicate in the Bay Area indicating um, that RNA is increasing rapidly. So as masking mandates fall away, we may actually be seeing um, some areas where we're gonna see more, uh, more infections rather than uh, fewer infections. Um, on March 4th, there was an announcement from the Food and Drug Administration about J&J &J vaccine. They have authorized an extension of the shelf life of refrigerated J&J &J from six months to nine months. And they said that this extension was granted following a thorough data review and applies to all refrigerated vials of J&J &J 
Um, so if you have some of this in your refrigerator and you have been storing it per manufacturer's recommendation, the shelf life is now nine months. So you don't have to dump it if you're in that window. Um, on Mar March 9th, Pfizer announced that they are gonna be doing some formal testing of their oral anti-SARS-CoV-2 um, drug Paxlovid in, in, in kids between the ages of six and 17 who are at high risk for progression to severe disease. These um, kids will be divided into two groups, the big kids who are at least 40 kilos and the small kids who are 20 to 40 kilos. Now, uh, Paxlovid is already um, has emergency use authorization for kids 12 and over, but this is gonna be a more formal look at these younger kids. Um, and they are also working on a formulation of Paxlovid that will be adjusted for size in kids who are under six years old. So that data, um, it's gonna be a fairly small study and I think the data will be um, available fairly soon. Um, Delta Cron has had some attention in the news in the last couple of weeks. Um, this is an a, a this is an organism that is a recombinant coronavirus that combines elements of Omicron and Delta. Um, it was first identified actually in Cyprus by um, an investigator there, but. Um, then, I, so anyway, I read about that this morning um, while I was eating breakfast, um, but in the news reports, it says that it was first identified by a U.S. researcher in February who was re reviewing GISAID uh, data, which is the um, repository for uh, genomes that get, uh, for isolates that get whole genome sequencing, and um, in uh, this individual, I identified a French isolate that looked like it was a recombination, uh, a recombinant of Delta and Omicron, and that was confirmed and the genome was posted on March 8th. Um, it should be noted that the spike uh, genes come almost entirely from Omicron and the rest of the genome is Delta. And that would predict that this um, recombinant might confer a more um, mild disease. Antibodies against Omicron from infected or and or vaccinated individuals should be effective against uh, this um, recombinant virus. And so far, there have been 33 isolates from France, eight from Denmark, one from the Netherlands, and two from the United States. But I, I believe that this phenomenon is being followed. And I think that the name of this is going to be XD. That will be the designation for this recombinant um, uh, strain of um, SARS-CoV-2. So there's some data that are going to be um, coming quickly um, from vaccine manufacturers. Yesterday, Pfizer announced that it's going, it is seeking FDA um, emergency use authorization for a fourth dose of vaccine in people over 65. And this is going to be based on some Israeli data that they're going to, uh, that they're submitting to the FDA. I'm going to show you a bit of that um, data in a minute. Um, their data probably will also include their fourth dose of a regular Pfizer vaccine and combination vaccine, which specifically targets Omicron, although that was not made explicit in the announcement. So I'm not actually sure if they're ready with those data or not. Also coming um, next month, we should expect to see data from the Pfizer study of a three-dose regimen for kids under the age of five who did not respond well. Recall the two to fives didn't really respond um, adequately to their three microgram dose. So these are the data from um, extending that regimen to a third dose. And also coming soon will be Moderna's study in kids six to 11 and in under sixes. And those are individuals who are getting a two dose regimen at 25 micrograms per dose, which is considerably higher and a quarter of the, uh, nor, uh, the adult dose. So hopefully we'll see some um, promising data there. So the, um, the, the fourth doses in Israel data has finally been posted. These are not peer reviewed, but they were posted in the last few days. Um, and these are data from the Israel Ministry of Health. There were actually two papers that were posted, uh, this one and another one from one of the large HMOs in Israel. And 
Um, I wanted to present both, but in the preprint on the other paper, uh, the, the top of the table was cut off in the preprint. And so I really wasn't able to make heads or tails of those data. And it was a bit of a different question that was asked. So I'm just gonna show you this data. Um, so they asked the question, what is the effect of a fourth Pfizer dose on confirmed COVID-19 infection and severe illness? Um, and they used the NIH definition of respiratory rate more than 30, oxygen saturation um, less than 94% on room air, um, et cetera, as what they considered severe illness. So they extracted data from the Ministry of Health database for the whole country for January 15th to 27th, just a two week period when Omicron was uh, the dominant isolate. And they uh, looked at over a million people over the age of 60 who were eligible for a fourth dose. Um, and so these are individuals who already had three doses, but were at least four months from their third dose. And they compared the rate of confirmed infection and the rate of severe illness in these individuals who were with or without a fourth dose. So the data can be summarized here, um, looking at confirmed infections, individuals who had a third dose only versus individuals who had who were more than 12 days out from their fourth dose. And this is looking at the rate ratio. So individuals who had three doses were twice as likely um, to develop a confirmed infection compared to individuals who had a fourth dose. And looking at severe illness, um, individuals who had three doses were over um, four times more likely to have severe illness compared with individuals who had a fourth dose. So the conclusion was that a fourth dose of vaccine was effective against both confirmed infection and severe illness with Omicron compared to a third dose that was administered at least four months pre previously. The other study was done in healthcare workers and it showed that individuals, just from the abstract, um, it showed that individuals who, were, uh, who received a fourth dose could still become infected. Um, their diseases were asymptomatic or mild and um, they had a fair amount of virus, so were considered uh, uh, potential transmitters of infection. But I, sorry, I can't show you those data. Um, this is um, some information from the uh, website for the Florida Department of Public Health. And as I have mentioned in the past, their motto is, it's a new day in public health, and it most certainly is. This was a posting March 8th of this year. Um, the Florida Department of Health is the first state in the nation, and uh, that's my bolding there. Um, but I, I feel that this was a posting that was um, done with great pride um, to issue guidance stating that healthy children from ages 5 to 17 may not benefit from receiving the currently available COVID-19 vaccine. And the, uh, Dr. Lap Latipo, the Surgeon General, who is highly controversial, is quoted there saying, based on currently available data, the risks of administering COVID-19 vaccine among healthy children may outweigh the benefits. So of course, I think that there are um, abundant data that would refute this, but this nonetheless is the, state, uh, the, the statement from the Department of Public Health about vaccines in kids. So this is a, um, an MMWR um, publication on the effectiveness of Pfizer in kids five to 17 years old. This is a case control test negative study that was published in the last week, I believe, um, that asked the question, how well did two doses of Pfizer protect against COVID-19 associated emergency department and urgent care encounters and hospitalizations? among healthy five to 17 year olds. So they used data from the vision network, which included over 39,000 emergency room and urgent care encounters and um, 1,700 hospitalizations in kids five to 17 who had a COVID-19 like illness across 10 states. And these data were collected between April 9th, 2021 and January 29th, 2022. So, um, spanned the uh, de both Delta and Omicron surges. And they estimated vac vaccine effectiveness by both age and time from vaccination during Delta and Omicron. 
So these are data on vaccine effectiveness in five in uh, for emergency room and urgent care encounters during Delta or Omicron in five to 11 year olds using unvaccinated kids as a reference, two doses of a vaccine, a Pfizer vaccine uh, in a pretty short, narrow window up to uh, just over two months um, showed a vaccine effectiveness of 46%. So that means that there was a 46% reduction in the risk that kids would re present to an emergency room or an urgent care center with COVID. Looking at 12 to 15 year olds using the same reference for unvaccinated, two doses out five months provided 83% uh, effectiveness in um, for these kids um, and if you even go beyond uh, going beyond five months, more than 150 days, the vaccine effectiveness drops significantly to 38%. Um, and there were not enough kids who had received a third dose in order to do a calculation here. But if you look at 16 to 17 year olds who had many more um, uh, uh, chances to get third doses, their vaccine effectiveness was 76%. It dropped significantly after two doses but a third dose reconstituted their uh, protection to uh, at, at least as good a level as after two doses. So there was clearly a benefit to these kids um, after two or three doses of uh, vaccine. This is looking at hospitalizations, again, during Delta or Omicron in kids five to 11 years old with a reference of unvaccinated, after two doses of vaccine, again, again in this very narrow window, um, the vaccine effectiveness was 74%, looking at 12 to 15 year olds after two doses, 92%, but dropped, uh, dropped somewhat after, beyond five months. And then in six to 16 to 17 year olds, um, a, a high uh, level of um, vaccine of, of protection against hospitalization dropping down um, after uh, five months, but then being completely reconstituted after three doses. So the conclusions were that two doses protect against COVID-19 associated emergency department and urgent care encounters in children and adolescents. The um, effectiveness was lower during Omicron and decreased with time since vaccination. I didn't show you the stratification between Omicron and Delta, but this was noted. Um, and then a booster dose restored vaccine effectiveness to 81% in 16 to 17 year olds. There were um, two, the two dose vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 was associated with decrease in risk for hospitalization from 73 to 94%. And their recommendation was that all children and adolescents should remain up to date with COVID-19 vaccinations, including a booster dose for kids 12 to 17, um, in uh, contrast to the recommendations from the state of Florida. And there were some limitations to the study, which I'm not gonna go into because I wanna leave adequate time for um, the Phyllis and, um, I mean, um, Lois and Judy and at the end. Um, uh, BA.2 is continuing, in the, this is a subvariant of Omicron, continuing to um, increase pretty rapidly. Um, the last time I talked about this, I believe the, um, the, uh, it, it constituted 10%, about 10% of isolates. It is now this week 23% um, uh, of isolates in, um, in the United States. This was a, a letter to the editor uh, that appeared in the New England Journal in the last week or so about the efficacy of antiviral agents against BA.2 subvariant. It came from Japan. And now some background is that BA.2 is now the dominant strain in Denmark, India, and the Philippines. And while it has um, many um, mutation differences between the standard Omicron strain or BA.1, there are 40 different uh, differences in mutations. There are four substitutions in the receptor binding domain on the spike protein that are not present in BA.1. So the question is, are antiviral agents still effective against BA.2 with these significant substitutions in the receptor binding domain? So they used a BA.2 viral isolate in a traveler returned to Japan from India and they used a live virus plaque reduction neutralization test using monoclonal antibodies. 
remdesivir, Paxlovid, and molnupiravir to see if there was retained activity. So um, I want to focus your attention down here on the three combination monoclonal antibodies that are currently on the market and S309, which is a precursor of citrovimab. And so what they found is that the Lilly um, monoclonal antibody cocktail um, lost neutralizing activity against BA.2. So this is looking at the factor increased compared with the original um, uh, ancestral strain. And so there is no activity there anymore. This is the Regeneron monoclonal antibody cocktail. And while the, um, the, the factor increase is 63, um, it is still considered uh, to have activity um, against, this, uh, against BA.2. And this is the monoclonal antibody cocktail that is in Evusheld, which is the monoclonal that's being advocated for individuals who uh, do not mount a, a significant immune response to vaccine. And you can see here that this is a very effective monoclonal antibody with the um, factor increase of only four compared with the ancestral strain. Now, if you look here at S309, which is Citrova, it's a precursor to Citrovimab, which is currently being used against Omicron. Um, and it had a lower neutralizing activity against BA.1 compared with the ancestral strain. And it has even less activity against um, BA.2, but still um, may have um, some activity. They didn't come down very strongly about this. And then if you look down here, um, uh, these are the um, drugs uh, susceptibilities. And the top one is, um, remdesivir, and the second one is molnupiravir, and the third one is Pfizer's Paxlovid, and you can see here that they retain very good activity against BA.2. Um, okay, um, my second to last uh, paper is a, a paper that has gotten a lot of press uh, since it uh, was, uh, this was actually published in Nature. Um, it came from the UK and it was a case control, controlled study of COVID-19 associated changes in the brain that asked the question, are there longitudinal changes in brain structure or function that occur following COVID-19? And this was a very interesting study and, and compelling study that was done on brain changes in 401 cases of individuals who had paired imaging from the UK Biobank, which is a repository for central nervous system imaging studies. And these are individuals who tested positive for infection with SARS-CoV-2 between their two scans. So they had a baseline and then they had a post. Um, and this was just, this was serendipitous, but um, allowed them to do this study. And then they had 384 controls who were matched for age, sex, ethnicity, and time elapsed between the two scans. And I believe they were also um, matched for the type of scan that was done. So this is a repository of all kinds of CNS imaging. So this is looking at um, comparing um, individuals in the study, looking at their gray matter thickness and uh, tissue contrast as a way of assessing the volume of the brain. And you can see here the controls are in blue and the cases are in red. And this is looking at, um, this is stratifying by increasing age. And as individuals, uh, the controls, um, be the, uh, the controls had a decrease in overall brain volume um, with age, but the cases had a much greater significantly greater decrease in brain um, volume with age. And the same uh, process, is, the same phenomenon is seen here where individuals somehow actually even had a little a bit of an increase with age, but the cases had a steady decline in um, volume of the brain with age. And this is looking at two specific areas of the brain, the um, left parahippocampal gyrus and the left orbitofrontal cortex. This is looking at the amount of tissue damage that is done um, with age. And uh, again, the, uh, the controls are in blue and the cases are in red. And looking at tissue damage in the 
pure temporal piriform cortex functional network. Um, with age, the controls um, are slightly going um, downhill, so a little bit of damage over time, but um, not much damage over time, I should say, but the cases um, are showing a fair amount of uh, uh, damage to this particular area of the brain with time. And the same thing is here, I'm looking at the olfactory tube, tubercle functional network, and these are having to do with um, obviously olfactory function. Um, a lot of damage with, um, with age and um, uh, much greater than the controls um, damage with, with age. Um, so they also looked at a functional, some functional testing in these individuals, and they found that the duration to complete a trail A, and I think one of the trails was look, looking at numbers and one was looking at letters, um, and the individuals had to complete a trail um, in a specific amount of time. And this is looking at the percent change in the duration of time to complete the trail uh, against age. And you can see that again, the controls are blue and the cases are red and the cases uh, required a much greater change in duration to complete trail A compared to controls. And the same is true for, for trail B. They, it took them a lot longer to complete the trail compared to controls at any particular age. So the conclusions were that COVID-19 was associated with significant deleterious impact on the brain, mostly in the limbic and olfactory cortical system. COVID-19, the COVID-19 group showed greater reduction in global brain size. The COVID-19 group showed significantly greater cognitive decline between two time points. They said that the results might be in vivo hallmarks of degenerative spread of infection via the olfactory pathways or of neuroinflammatory phenomena or of loss of sensory input due to anosmia. And I think that, that the third one is the least likely because individuals generally will um, regain that function. But they said that it's unknown whether changes can be partly reversed or will persist in the long term. So we have yet another reason um, not to get COVID. There were limitations to this study. They, they did not stratify by disease severity other than hospitalization or not. They didn't have uh, a clinical correlates they didn't identify um, isolates by strain, and these were mostly white patients whose scans were contributed to the um, UK Biobank. My last paper is about um, the characteristics of long COVID in a very large study that was reported from Denmark. This was a cross-sectional nationwide test negative case control study that asked the question, what are the characteristics of post-acute symptoms in non-hospitalized COVID patients? So these are individuals who had mild disease. They had included in this study uh, almost 153,000 individuals who were at least 15 years old who had PCR confirmed SARS-CoV-2 between September 2020 and April 2021. So this was before Delta and Omicron. In that group, they had 61,000 patients. And then they had corresponding test negative control group of um, about 92,000 patients. And they had many more negative, uh, negative controls than um, PCRs. It was a two to three um, ratio um, because they anticipated that individuals who tested negative were gonna be less likely uh, to participate in the study. But as it turned out, the uh, response rate was 40% in the cases and um, 36 percent in the test negative group. They used a web-based questionnaire that was administered six, nine, or 12 months after a test was done, and they used the eBox system in Denmark, which is a platform that offers electronic communication with public authorities, and it is used by 92 percent of all Danes who are 15 years of age or, or older. So this is looking at risk differences in symptoms after six to 12 months, comparing individuals who were test positive with test negative. And you can see here the percentages of positives uh, uh, for each symptom um, 
in the, these are individuals who tested positive and individuals who tested negative. And this looks at the risk difference in these, um, in these two groups. So you can see here that the rate, greatest risk difference is with um, dysosmia or, or um, aberration in sense of smell, aberration in sense of taste. They are way out here with a very large risk difference. Also fatigue and shortness of breath. These were the four highest um, symptoms that were um, reported, but there were also a number of other symptoms that also had significant risk differences that included um, reduced strength, um, sleeping, uh, feeling of legs and arms going to sleep, which is a symptom I had not heard before, um, muscle and joint pain, headache, dizziness, chest pain, et cetera. This is looking at the risk difference of self-reported health problems that were had a new onset between their test date and um, six to 12 months after the test date. And so again, these are individuals who tested positive, individuals who tested negative, and physical exhaustion was a self-reported health um, problem that had a risk difference of 40. Mental exhaustion had a risk difference of um, 32, and difficulty concentrating, also very high, memory issues, and even sleep problems that had not been a prominent symptom in other studies, also um, a very significant um, risk difference here. And then finally, um, these are self-reported new diagnoses between six and 12 months after the, uh, the test was done, uh, looking at a new diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, the risk difference was two and a half compared to individuals who tested negative. Anxiety and depression, the risk difference was just over one, um, but PTSD and fibromyalgia were not significantly increased. So the conclusions were that the highest risk differences were observed for alterations in smell and taste, fatigue and shortness of breath. COVID cases were more often, more often reported physical symptoms, new onset diagnoses and other health problems out uh, six to 12 months from their, from their test compared to test negative controls. The prevalence of physical and mental exhaustion was markedly increased in cases compared to controls. And new diagnoses of chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, and anxiety were more common after a positive test. There were some limitations in this study as well, but I will, um, I think at this point, stop sharing and then turn um, things over to Lois and Judian. Great, Dr. Gold, thank you so much. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Judian Smith and Dr. Lois Friedman. And Judian and Lois, if you could turn on your um, cameras, that would be great. Yes. Wonderful. So um, we are, the doctors are going to do um, a brief review of um, a recent article about COVID and mental health. And if you have any, um, you know, mental health and COVID related questions, please feel free to put those in the um, Q&A icon on your Zoom toolbar. Everything ready? Are you going to advance them then? Jill? Yes, I'll go ahead and advance. Okay, them. very good. So I'm going to speak today about the risks of mental uh, health disorders in survivors of COVID-19. And I'm going to start with a new uh, study that was published on February 16th of this year uh, by, in the uh, British Medical Journal. And it was a cohort study using the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs National Database. And it is, there's been other studies that have looked at this, but this is the first st study that looked a full one year out from acute COVID infections to see if there were continued effects on mental health. They took um, over 153,000 people with PCR confirmed COVID infections and compared them to two different groups. One was a contemporary group during the time of COVID with um, however, who had had no evidence of COVID-19 infections. And that was over 5 million people. The other was a historical control group that was taken just before COVID-19 pandemic, again, over 5 million 
uh, patients. These were mostly white men with an average age of 63. But because they use such large numbers, we can even look at the women's outcome. So what they found was one year after after testing positive for a COVID infection, patients still showed an increased risk for mental disorders over those that did not have a positive test during that time for COVID-19. And this included in the areas of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, sleep disorders, and cognitive decline. Um, more specifically, patients with a history of COVID-19 infections had a 60% higher risk for mental health diagnoses and or mental health um, prescriptions one year post-infection compared with the co uh, control groups. This in, in essence added 64 mental health diagnoses uh, per 1,000 patients to the baseline level. So there's already a high uh, baseline level with the stress of COVID-19, but this added an additional 64 per 1,000 patients. So breaking this down, we had a one year post uh, COVID-19 infections, what they saw were 24 additional cases of sleep disorders per 1,000 people, 15 additional cases of depression, 11 additional cases of anxiety disorders, 13 additional cases of stress and adjustment disorders, 15 additional cases of cognitive decline, and four additional cases of substance use disorder. The risk, they found the risks were highest in COVID patients with the most severe disease, but they still saw an increased risk with even low uh, severity disease. They also compared patients who uh, had a history of COVID-19 infection with patients who were treated with influenza and found a higher risk of these mental health uh, diagnosis and need for treatment with the patients who had COVID-19 infections. Um, they looked at patients with a history of COVID-19 infections and compared them with patients admitted to the hospital for any other illness, including heart attacks, cancer, strokes, et cetera. And they found that patients um, with COVID-19 infections in the past had a much higher risk of mental you know, diagnosis. So I'll just add in one other just uh, quick study, which is they, there was a group um, that looked at healthcare workers and depression. Um, and they happened to do a study, a group at Penn State College of Medicine conducted a screening for depression in multiple hospital systems right before the pandemic. Before the pandemic. And they found 10% rate of major depression among physicians. They redid this screening after the pandemic started and the rate of reported depression among, depre uh, among the physicians had increased to 30 to 33%. Now this would obviously add in both the stress of what the physicians and medical um, personnel were going through at the time, but also possibility of they're getting infection effective and the implications of that um, in increasing depression and anxiety symptoms. And then I just want to touch on the study that uh, Dr. Gold already mentioned, the Nature, published in Nature on, on uh, March 7th, the study that looked at uh, the brain abnormalities testing with MRIs and CT scans before and after COVID-19 infections. Only I'm going to just uh, mention it in terms of what we know here with the mental health diagnosis implications. So again, what they found were significant damaging impact associated with COVID-19 infections on these scans. And this uh, impact, as Dr. Gold mentioned, were mainly seen to start in the olfactory nucleus, but they also then extended into the limbic system, which is our emotional regulation center as well as pronounced reductions of gray matter thickness in the perihippocampal gyrus and the lateral orbital 
uh, frontal cortex. And again, hospice patients showed the greater reduction in gray matter thickness, but changes were also seen in patients with mild COVID-19 infections. And uh, they found corresponding declines in neuropsychiatric testing. And this really parallels what the British Medical Journal study was finding in their data um, one year after COVID infections. So in summary, patients with COVID infections appear to still have an increased risk for all types of mental disorders one year after acute COVID infections. This corresponds with a new study showing measurable changes in brain imaging before and after COVID infections. And this has significant implications for patients' morbidity, cost to our healthcare system, as well as for the healthcare workers who have been providing them with care during this time. Thank you. Dr. Smith, thank you so much. And um, we've also included um, a list of references um, as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop that share. And I wanted to um, encourage any of the audience members, if you have any questions regarding COVID and mental health to please put them in the Q&A icon on your Zoom toolbar. And um, we'll also um, entertain general questions about COVID-19 as well. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take a look here. And actually, before we start, I wanted to clarify that for our last COVID-19 session next week, which is sponsored by Direct Relief, the registration link is different um, and the Zoom link will be different than it normally has been. And so when you get your follow-up email um, either tomorrow or Friday, um, you'll be able to register and then the reminder that will come out next week as well. But just wanted to give you the heads up um, about that. And um, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the questions here. So uh, let's start off with many of the rapid tests sent by the government have expiration dates soon or past. Do you think they are useful after their expiration date? Um, you know, I, um, I always use medication that is expired, like even expired for years. But um, because I know some data that suggests that expired medication works just as well, even several years out, I don't know of data for um, rapid antigen tests. And so I probably would not trust a rapid antigen test that was um, past its expiration date. Because mm -hmm. um, that, you know, the, the, the results of that test are actionable in a big way. And I wouldn't want to have a false negative or false positive result. Thank you. Of the symptoms reported for infected patients, how many with the mental residual had been vaccinated prior to illness? And so um, Judy, and that, um, this is a question in the chat. So of the symptoms reported for infected patients, how many with the mental residual had been vaccinated prior to illness? Great question, but I, I didn't see any data on the uh, British Medical Journal study. Um, I don't know if they looked at that. They, I, um, I saw no mention of that in the study. Yeah, thank you. Um, any attempt to compare severe illness or death of a family member in the two groups? Intuitively, one might think this risk might be higher in those who had COVID. I'm sorry, could you say, ask that question sure. again? Yeah, any attempt to compare severe illness or death of a family member in the two groups? Intuitively, one might think this risk might be higher in those who had COVID. Are you talking about the British Medical Journal study, that I, one? I'm not sure. Joan, if you could um, just put some clarification in. I'm just going to jump to another, another question. We can come back to that. And then um, this is a question regarding regard to suicide occurrence. Has there been any data in regard to suicide occurrence and changes over this time frame with COVID as per certain age groups or gender? Um, Lois, do you have Actually, there was an article published yesterday about an increase in suicide rate um, in the over 65 population, which pre-COVID was, I have to check the numbers, but was in 2020, um, it was 55, it, it went up 30%. So pre-COVID to, to during COVID. Um, and this article cited isolation as a big increased factor. These weren't people who definitely necessarily had COVID. 
So it's a community survey again, but the numbers definitely increased. There's Great. another article out of um, actually Russia that confirms similar kind of statistics. Great, thank you. And then getting back to Joan's question, she did say yes about the British Medical Journal about comparing severe illness, death of a family member in the two groups. It, it had no access to that data because they used a database that only looked at the patient's history. So I, I don't think they would have access to the family members, unfortunately. Great. That would be a great study to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Debbie, back to you. Is the fourth dose uh, a lower dose than the first two in the Pfizer, Moderna, and or the booster? The um, In Israel, all the doses are the same. They're all Pfizer and they're all 30 micrograms. Um, Moderna's booster is 50 micrograms. Um, I'm not seeing anything about a fourth dose study coming out of Moderna anytime soon. So I think it's a standard 30 microgram dose, um, all the doses are the same for Pfizer. How soon after Paxlovid can isolation end the antibody, uh, sorry, antigen turn negative, PCR turning negative? <laughs> I think that the, um, the guidelines for isolation for infected people is independent of whether they're taking uh, medication or or monoclonal antibody or not. So you can, the, the formal guideline is five days in isolation and the duration of Paxlovid is five days. Um, and then you can emerge from isolation, but you have to wear a, a well-fitting mask for an additional five days. Um, and I believe those guidelines are independent of any treatment. I, I don't think you can get out faster if you take Paxlovid or Molnupiravir or a monoclonal antibody. Great, thank you. Do you recommend increased mitigation in areas where wastewater studies show evidence of increasing COVID virus? Well, we know that um, virus can be detected in sewage before rates start to go up in the community where that sewage comes from. So I think it wouldn't be a bad idea, but at this point, there aren't any guidelines about ramping up mitigation. And I think that we're gonna have to see increasing rates in communities again and again and again before, <laughs> before somebody's gonna make a, or before the CDC or, or will make a recommendation or even a local health authority will make a re recommendation about um, ramping up mitigation measures in response to increased identification of RNA in sewage. Thank you. What criteria can we identify regarding case rate, hospitalization rate, and mortality secondary to COVID? And over what period of observation might allow us to say that a pandemic has become an endemic? Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. <laughs> um, what, let's see, we, we can break it. What criteria can we identify regarding case rate, hospitalization rate, and mortality secondary to COVID over what period of observation might allow us to say that a pandemic has become an endemic? So it's really about the pandemic becoming an endemic. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the specific criteria will be. Um, but certainly there has to be ongoing low levels of transmission. There has to be an, an, a healthcare system that is not overwhelmed in any way. Uh, there has to be easily available testing and treatment so that things can remain at a very low level. But as long as there are places in the world, like in Asia, where Omicron is surging and probably mutating like crazy, um, we can't say that the, the virus is endemic. It is still a pandemic. Um, so we are, we are not in, at an endemic um, level right now. And we may temporarily be at low levels in most places in the United States. But um, as long as there are areas in, on the globe that are surging, 
we are not at an endemic, um, uh, it, the virus is not endemic, it is still a pandemic. Thank you. And here's another mental health question. Are there studies on the mental or physical health effects from the polarization and or confusion of the public resulting from conflicting facts presented so forcefully by influential personalities? So are, are there any studies on the mental or physical health effects from the polarization and or confusion of the public resulting from conflicting facts, in quotations, presented so forcefully by influential personalities? I haven't seen any studies. I you know, think patients come in confused. I think it makes interactions with patients more challenging because they're not getting clear messaging, but I haven't seen any studies yet another good thing to study, um, although hard to study. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything. Mm -mm. Thank you. I know it stressed me. Mm -hmm. um, and I would think most doctors and nurses and staff that I talk to trying to deal with vaccination, hesitation, all of that so very stressful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, back to Debbie. Is BA2 um, variant spreading in Europe and are they going through a surge? BA.2 is spreading in some parts of Europe. Uh, so interestingly, it is it has been dominant for weeks in Denmark, but not in the other Scandinavian countries. It's been uh, dominant in India and the Philippines, but not in um, countries that are close by. So um, it's sporadic at this point, um, certainly rising rapidly in the United States. Um, but um, anyway, I, I think we're, we're gonna have to watch closely. It does seem to have a, a, a significant transmission um, capability, or it's, it's more transmissible than regular Omicron, but does not confer more severe disease. So it will um, spread in populations, but not make people tre tremendously sick, but they'll be able to, um, with more people who are infected and have a virus in their nose, they can transmit to other people. And so I think it's gonna prolong the pandemic um, because of the, the particular qualities of this uh, subvariant. Thank you. So now that masks are coming off in schools and in public, what are you predicting and how do you recommend we change our behavior? So I think that the increased identification of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in sewage might reflect the relaxation of mitigation measures in communities, in schools, et cetera. And so I think we're gonna have to wait and see what happens over the next maybe two to four weeks and see if um, case rates start to go up in communities where um, mitigation measures have been lax for a longer period of time. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. We'll just have to wait and see. Great. And Judy and, and Lois, um, any comments um, either in um, your own practices or just that what you've heard from colleagues about, you know, numbers of patients that are, you know, seeking help with anxiety and depression, um, either because they have had COVID or just living in this COVID uncertain world um, and any, you know, specific recommendations or tips in terms of, you know, treatment or helping patients to deal with it. Um, you know, I think that there are three groups of people coming in, people who have mental illness and then, so they're getting ongoing psychiatric treatment, um, people who sort of have anxiety and depression about getting ill themselves, and then people who have new blossoming illness that maybe would or would not have come out during COVID. Um, I think the approaches are the same that they would be pre-COVID, um, you know, our usual armamentarium of supportive therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies for the appropriate people, medication. Um, the other one that's been really an increased problem and harder to get a handle on, I think, is um, substance abuse, alcohol, and, and certainly opioids. Um, and that's been a major challenge. The 
sort of positive to the pandemic is that there's been an increase in seeing patients who couldn't have been seen easily virtually. So there's a population that has actually benefited from the use of Zoom and other ways to see people, which did not really exist um, prior to the pandemic. So, and I can't break it down into percentages at all. And I haven't seen any studies, but there are some people who have gotten increased mental health care because of the new technologies. Um, so that's sort of what I'm seeing. How about you, Judy? Um, well, there was a shortage of psychiatrists even before this. So this has made it worse because the demand is way up. And um, so that's further problem. And I know people I've consulted with on the Maven project also, they just can't get a hold of mental health providers. They're, they're often having to provide psychiatric care themselves for people with severe bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, all sorts of things for four to five months before they can get a man with a psychiatrist. Um, they've had patients discharged from a psychiatric hospital to their own care. It's really a dilemma for uh, these providers. Um, so my hat's off to all of you that are doing that. Um, I have um, also heard some concerns about the online services. There, there's, it, in some ways it's enhanced and or increased coverage, but there's also some sketchy groups out there providing care and they don't, when the primary providers want the, uh, to know what medications these people were treated with or whatever for their psychiatric disorder, this, the group won't send records. They can't get records even though they've got signed release. It just seems like there's some sketchy groups running some uh, Zoom type uh, psychiatric services at this point too, which is a disappointment. The one other thing that I would add is some of my colleagues, you know, I've got a kind of a, I can't take on many new people at this point in my practice because I'm going to be closing my practice. So, um, but when I've talked to some of my colleagues who have seen patients with COVID, you know, post COVID onset, depression and anxiety, they are reporting this is more difficult to treat and may not respond as well to the medications that we use for psychiatric disorders. And I wish a study would be done on that. That seems really crucial. And um, looking at, you know, this data that Dr. Gold presented today and, you know, with the MRI changes, it, that could really explain some of that. There's a small group that's doing, did just some trial work with um, using transmagnetic stimulation, but an alternating current. I don't understand all of it, but they had ophthalmologists on board and just did it with, you know, it's just a pilot study, but it was really interesting. Patients with brain fog and all these things that weren't responding to medications, they uh, did this alternating uh, electrical simulation and literally the ophthalmologist could see changes in the vasculature of the retinas and the patients walked away going, my brain fog feels like it's lifted. Now there are no controls, you know, what not, but so we'll see what happens with that, but there might be something to that treatment if we watch down the road and we finally get, you know, larger studies and controls, to, you know, controls and things like that. So. Anyway. There are there are studies of long COVID that are going on in large centers like Mount Sinai and UCSF, and, and there are a number of other ones now. And they are multidisciplinary clinics where patients are being seen by all kinds yeah. of subspecialists, including psychi or specialists, including yeah. psychiatrists. So I think we're going to be seeing plenty of data coming down the pike in the next year or so about um, best practices for treating patients who have consequences of COVID. Yeah, we're gonna need it. And so that's good. 
And this is the last question. Any studies that address the benefit of wearing a mask when almost all those around you are not? No, um, in the very beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of studies that were done um, that were dummy studies where one dummy was wearing a mask and the other dummy wasn't wearing a mask. And there was a, a, a the dummy could cough virus and you could measure the amount of virus that was being transmitted. And the optimal, um, the optimal setup for um, preventing transmission of um, um, virus was where both dummies were masked. And that was better than one masked and one not masked. I think that's the best that I could do um, for data. And that was, you know, albeit that was um, in vitro data with, with a dummy setup. Um, but I think it's better than not wearing a mask. Um, but it's the optimal thing is where everybody wears a mask around you. And um, so people who are immunocompromised, people who are not expected to make a robust or durable response to vaccine, who are now at increased risk because they're going to be standing in line at the post office and they're going to be the only one wearing a mask. Um, and I, I think that there's nothing to be done about that at this point. Um, they're going to just de facto be at increased risk. Great. Thank you so much. Um, before I get to my formal thank yous, I wanted to remind everybody that our last session is next Wednesday, March 23rd, same time. Just of note that the Zoom link will be different because the session is being sponsored by um, one of our clinic partnerships, Direct Relief, so that you will need to register when you get the follow-up emails from Maven Project later this week with the video of today. Um, and also there were a reminder email that comes out next week on Tuesday. So please make sure to formally register because the usual Zoom link won't, won't work for that. Um, and then um, also we would welcome any words of thanks or gratitude to Dr. Gold and to our physician volunteer panelists. So feel free to email me at jeinstein at mavenproject.org so I can pass those along to everybody. And then a big thank you for Dr. Gold for today's session and also to Dr. Smith and to Dr. Friedman for um, preparing information on mental health and COVID. And um, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. So have a good week, everybody. Take care. Thank you.